So the title's a little more provocative than what I had in the in the abstract. It's quite an awkward place to be. Um, I'm going to try and race through a condensed version of a story that I've been telling for a while, and it really begun with teaching first year physics through a hands-on approach, and normally I'd have a big chunk to tell you about that. Um, I don't. I'm going to focus on the makerspace, which is where it led. Uh, but what I will say is that it really all begun with these four objects. So we start every semester by giving our students these four objects and we tell them to build a motor. And that's it, right? And I promise you that you can make a motor with a screw, a battery, a wire and a magnet. Um, and then we get them to explain it and so on. And really what this is about is that science and I think education in general is uh, it's all about play first, and somehow I think people have forgotten that, that you've got to actually ask questions about the world and interact with it and play with it, and then you can start to think about theories. So I really firmly believe um, in learning by doing, in learning by, by interacting with, with the world. Um, I've been doing so for... I'm pretty sure Tom wants to be in here. Um, but... <laughs> um, uh, I've been doing this since 2012, um, and it made me realize that not only this, but you need a variety of different people, so some interdisciplinarity in the room, and, and I always missed that, I think, coming to ANU, uh, and I wanted a space to support that, and so we kind of started with a vision in 2015 um, around something that you know we call the makerspace, and it's basically an environment that has many different people of all sorts, different disciplines and so on, working together on project-based learning, um, as well as, you know, so that can be for, for university learning or other personal projects. So we sort of had this idea that it should have um, undergraduates and graduates, teachers, researchers, professional staff, academic staff in there. Um, we wanted tools in there, um, real research tools in some case, for people to experiment and work together on projects. Um, you know, and that this knowledge would flow organically. So it's not a programmed environment. No one can book it out. It's actually completely open um, uh, for people to come in and use this space. We started it in the School of Physics, but it is the ANU makerspace. So we have it. You know, any of you could come and sign up. Um, weekly inductions uh, let you in. And so my boss was convinced of this vision, and so we we fitted out a, a small 70 square meter space. Um, over the other side of campus, near psychology and engineering, the old department of physics, if you know where that is. Um, and we opened the doors in February of 2016. As I said, anyone with a UID can join. You generally bring your own materials to work on projects. We have a whole bunch of tools and resources, including all the buzzword <coughs> things like 3D printers, but actually I think that the hammers and the nails and the, the glue are more important. Um, also, the laser cutter, which is, which is unique on campus and really, really useful. We've got a sewing machine, there's soldering, there's testing of electronics, um, and we've just got a, a CNC mill. Um, it's loosely staffed, so I try to get in there as much as I can. I'm unfortunate I don't have as much time for it as I would like, but uh, we do have another uh, staff member that's in there three days a week. Um, actually, it's, it's partly student-led, so we actually have very keen groups of the community that essentially become volunteers and help other people. Uh, first come, best dressed sort of culture, um, lots of respect, and it's really about that community. It is not service space, so people don't come in and ask us to make stuff for them. They come in and say, I want to make this, and we say, great, how are you going to do it? Um, and they end up helping each other a lot. And so really what I'm going to do for most of the rest of this is try and give you a flavor of the kinds of things that have happened in there, keeping in mind that it did start from this idea of learning by doing in physics, and what we've ended up with is um, quite a diverse group of people. So this is what a busy day looks like. It's about five hours worth of time lapse. It gives you a sense of the space. So there's some 3D printers there, but then you've got electronics and the laser cutter over here, power tools, so on and so forth. Um, this is what the user base looks like over time. So we started in 2016, as I said. Um, and then that's September. We've actually just breached 700 inducted users. They come from those cohorts. So it's about 65% undergraduate, 20% um, postgraduate, 7% academic, 9% um, professional staff. That distribution roughly reflects the university. 
right? The university is predominantly undergraduates, um, and then all these other groups. In terms of where they come from, uh, they, th these three groups like to compete with each other. Physical science, so, so basically College of Science, College of Engineering and Computer Science, um, and, the, and CAS, mostly the School of Art. They're roughly, I mean, they've, they've taken over each other from time to time. Roughly, we think of them as our majority user groups. And then there's people from all over the place. Interestingly, the other units are the next competing group. And they're things like central, central areas, so professional stuff from central areas. Um, gender distribution is reasonable, given that it's a physics space. We'd love to get that into the 50-50 bracket. And we've got some ideas on how to do that. Um, the kinds of things that happen in there, they, they can be linked to coursework, but it's up to the convener. And actually what I'm here to do today is to try and encourage some of you to think about how you might utilise the space in your teaching. Um, so our Physics 2 convener wanted to use the space and so invented this project for Honours Pathway students where they had to make a complex pendulum. So that's a pendulum that has three or four arms and masses kind of going wacky all over the place. Um, they had to make it, video it, get the motion data and then model it using some, um, some theory they'd been learning about. And so students then had to make a video um, showing that and talking about how they did it. So we actually use video assessment quite a bit in some of our physics courses. Um, I started that a few years back. It's really good for demonstrating project-based learning when you don't have time to do lots of oral presentations. Um, I don't think audio is working, unfortunately. Sorry. Uh, these are, this, is a, this is a story about the second year printmaking cohort at the School of Art. So printmaking is where you take a plate and you etch it, often with acid, uh, ink it up and then press it into paper. Um, we bought this laser cutter that can etch metal and I was like, well, hey, because we bought it because we wanted to do circuit boards. Circuit boards are made in the same way and I suddenly made this link between the artistic medium of I don't know which century, a few centuries ago probably, um, and one that is, you know, this technique we used to make circuit boards and thought, can we do this with, with print plates? And the answer was yes, and so we kind of piloted it. Um, it worked really nicely. You get these kinds of beautiful prints out. And so the second year students in the School of Art now do this. Um, this is a, these are actually two of our mentors. They're students that volunteer their time for the spa to the space, but they also do this as part of their coursework. So here you've got, um, a, originally it was a family photograph. They pulled the different color pixels out, made a plate for cyan, magenta, um, yellow, I think, black, and then made a print based on those photographs. Um, Saskia actually made a 3D print of one of her laser etchings and all sorts of stuff that's really fun. Um, the group now, we work with Rebecca in the School of Art. Every year they invite the second year students across to use the space, um, in addition to the facilities they have at the School of Art. Coming back to physics, we've got a second year thermodynamics course. I don't know if sound's going to work, unfortunately. It didn't seem like it was working. I'll just narrate it. Michaela's actually narrating this. The unmixer is a demonstration of laminate layered flow. So normally you would mix these colored droplets up and they would kind of be indistinguishable. But if you go back the same number of times you went forwards, they unmix. So they had to kind of build this little thing and do that. Um, more recently, they had to make and model a Stirling engine. So they um, designed this engine, got some bits, put it together, had to explain how it works, make some measurements of it, learn what not to do. That's, that's wood with a, with a flame. Um, I'm pretty sure that was in our drop-in center, which is, yeah, but we're, we're okay with it. Um, we work with the Questacon Science Circus as well. So this is, for those that don't know, this is a master's program run out of Questacon. This group of students are hand-picked and they go on tour every year doing science communication shows to uh, regional Australia. So this is this year's cohort. Um, Graham Walker, who is someone we work with, he's an academic in CPAS really closely. Um, he has this great hovercraft that you can build in a day using plywood and vinyl and, and uh, some battery powered leaf blowers. And so they all got together to do this deep dive, um, build this hovercraft, and like, it really works quite well. <laughs> and some of them had never used a bandsaw before, so it was a really good way to both introduce them to each other and teamwork, but also teach them some basic skills. They also had to design their own exhibitions 
after uh, later that week and then have a go at building them. And this is a demonstration of sound waves. Uh, <coughs> there's a big speaker here. The pipe's closed. These are polystyrene beads. And sound is a compression wave, and so the beads are being squished up because of the, the pressure in the, in the air. Again, I apologise, there's no sound. You can normally hear the really high-pitched squeak that isn't very nice. <laughs> um, we've worked with the new design cohort at the School of Art, so they now have a design program. Um, in the, Mitchell Whitelaw and Jeff Hinchcliffe run that, and in the first year, there's a big group of students. We needed new branding, and so we thought, why don't we get them to design it based off a brief? Um, so this, this logo didn't exist at the beginning of this year. It was a first-year student who had designed it, along with all the other classmates, had, had done their own brief. Jeff and Mitchell and the tutors would have graded them. They passed over the high distinctions to us. We had a look through, shortlisted a few candidates, and actually brought them in as contractors, kind of on a paid internship, to work with us on refining it. So it was their first piece for their professional portfolio as a first-year student. Um, and so we've taken on this. This is our brand. Oh, how am I going for time? Um, this is one of my favourite projects. It was early when we started. Hugo Lee was a, sax, a saxophonist who was doing a music and a physics double degree. Um, he was really poor and couldn't afford mouthpieces, but wanted a big number of them. They were about $200 each. And one of us said to him, well, maybe you could make them. So he actually signed up for a third year research project course that we have in, in the school, um, where he had to design his own pieces, do the physics modeling of the acoustics, make them, and then measure them. Um, I can't play the sound for you. Uh, oh. um, but that's Hugo playing his pieces. Oh, I don't want to waste too much time on it, but what I can do, sorry, if you give me one second. Where is audio? Sorry, everyone. So Hugo now plays with these exclusively. He's pursuing a music career down in Melbourne. Um, and the thing is, I don't have too many quotes because they're not always that great, but no, they're, they're good, but I think you, don't, you shouldn't use them too much. Um, but he, it allowed him to further explore a field of acoustics, which is not something we teach. We don't have any acoustics in any of our programming, but he was able to learn about acoustics through this project. Um, this was a flea as part of another project that was CT scanned at the micro CT lab at the bottom of John Curtin Medical School. Um, the model was pulled apart into all its bits and then this student made an a outreach model for kids to play with. It's about that big and it's got a flexible exoskeleton and all bits on the inside. Um, I, look, I could talk, there's actually been a huge number of projects I could talk for hours. These are some of those circuit boards made on the laser cutter. I think there's a... There's a example of it. Um, Deirdre's a PhD student in art working on traditional projection systems. Um, I'm actually on her supervisor panel and she needed a 48-sided mirrored surface, 48-sided polygon. She had no idea how to make it. Um, we didn't, she didn't make it in the makerspace, but this is one of our amazing technical officers who we should really celebrate in this place for what they can do, who figured out how to do it for her. Um, she's made other bits and pieces in the makerspace for the, for the setup. Um, that's a protein model. This is from, I think, a group in digital humanities. They have all of their beautiful fossils and, and skulls and stuff, and so they're able to reproduce them so that people can actually play with them without affecting the original um, part. Richard Whiteley was approached by the Australia Day Council. He's the head of glass at the School of Art to make the Australian of the Year Award trophies, and so we were involved in the prototype of that. Um, some students got involved. Um, on both sides. So we didn't do that much. We kind of made these, these prints and, and did the digital model. And then that enabled the mold making to take place, which glass was then melted into. And then it was his students that did a lot of the finishing and polishing. Um, and they're just, I think the State Awards just got announced last week for this year's version. So they're slightly different. This was last year's. Um, we support startup companies. These guys make wireless charging systems that you can lay out on a whole surface. 
throw your phone down somewhere and it'll figure out where the phone is and energize it. Um, they're a great group of students from physics and engineering. It keeps going. A lot of it's personal projects. These were the Daft Punk helmets that were a gift. That's someone's guitar. It's a Zippo lighter, obviously. Um, that's a lamp I made my mum. Um, it kind of keeps going. This is a boat race that happens every year in the engineering cohort. They have to make these boats and race them on sullies. Someone's repairing their shoes. I, I could just keep going. But you can see a lot of this stuff on our Instagram page. So as usual, follow us, like us, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's just A in your makerspace. And you know, our website is also pretty easy. Uh, it's really easy to get involved. We've worked with conveners on projects. So these things are starting to pop up in academia. I don't know of anything quite as open as ours, particularly across campus. Um, they're really about the communities. Uh, the staff are critical, I think, but only in a guidance and teaching role. We really do have students as teachers in this space. And we trust them and empower them with safety, uh, as well as sort of calling people out. Um, the artists have a huge amount to contribute, and I think that in that vein, people should be talking about STEAM, not just STEM. Um, get in touch with me. Think about what making you can incorporate into your courses. It doesn't necessarily have to be physical making. There's all sorts of crea creativity you can bring in, um, and we're here to help. So, or you can come use it yourself. I know Priscilla has. Um, I just have to put these people up. Ella is, um, works with me in the space. She's amazing. Tim supported me and funded it. These are, those are the two mentors that I mentioned before, but we have several others. They actually get accreditation towards a Plus as a volunteer for the space, so... Sorry, thank you. Questions? Thank you very much for taking so many engineering students. Oh, you're so welcome. Uh, and we, you're usually directing your way. Any kind of plans for expansion or scale? Or? We're trying. So I'm actually working with Matt in, uh, a little bit on this. Um, so we're taking a few different approaches. We're trying to <coughs> get onto the senior management group and try and get something centrally supported. Um, I often say to people, these are the new computer lab. Uh, you look at computer labs around campus, a lot of them people are pushing the keyboards out of the way and putting their laptop on top. Um, but they have more and more these kinds of spaces. And when I say these kinds of spaces, I'm not saying everyone needs a 3D printer, but somewhere to collaborate and share ideas. Um, so we're working on with, with Grady actually on trying to get, see if Central are interested in supporting it. We have some ideas around how that's possible. The School of Art is already talking about consolidating their digital fabrication and making it more broadly available because they've seen how powerful that is. Um, and we want to work with them on doing that. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what's going on in engineering. Uh, we could probably talk about it later. But I actually think that having branches of this around the campus with equivalent, you know, sort of the same philosophy, possibly general induction that gets you into everywhere, and then machine specific induction, um, the way we manage all that is quite carefully thought out. And I think we figure that all out. So rather than people open up their own spaces and try and reinvent the wheel, I actually think we should try and do it as a, because we're starting from scratch, we should do it as a university initiative. Um, some universities have put these in libraries, so. What, what sort of equipment would you expand to say that if there are other spaces that would be building? It really depends on the local area. <coughs> so I think that's where you've sort of got this duality between a, a broadly accessible network but what's actually good for the area. School of Art has a water jet cutter that doesn't get used enough. Um, we've got a CNC mill now. Um, I know that engineering is interested in some of the more advanced 3D printer technology that can do things like carbon fiber. Um, it really depends on the area. Some people might go down the you know, screen printing path. I don't suppose there's like uh, an inventory of this stuff? Let me know what we've got. Uh, a lot of it's in my head, um, <laughs> just because I'm from being here a while and talking to people. Um, on this, on, on, there probably is because of the recent workshop review, but that might be at a higher level than we're talking in, in a lot of instances. Yeah. So, because what I was thinking is that I know I'm from research or management, I'm from a marketing group. If I come back up and say, make a space, it's freaking awesome, let's do something. 
and I can say we've got this, it can do that, we've got this, it can do that, mm. we'll get more traction, and mm. hey, we should do the thing. Mm. So, the, yeah, there's some... You mean within your school, what you've got, or uh, just, just across? Just across the campus, like, we know where to go to find, instead of me going and buying a 3D printer, I can say, right, our team should talk to this, this space here. Look, come and talk to us anyway, because at the moment, I think we do have a good sense of what's going on. I, we've also worked with the Digital Humanities Group um, over this side of campus, who have some probably the best 3D scanners, other than this micro CT lab, but that's pretty expensive and pretty intense for most purposes. Um, so the, those scanners, they were really interested in actually making them available broadly. Um, I'm sure there's a little bit more but, uh, that we don't know about, but we know of a lot that doesn't actually get a whole lot of use. So, so there are opportunities, I think. Right. Thank you so much. And I know that there's more questions to ask. So you can I'll be around. You can come and talk to me.